Hello, Ling441. Uh, we're back again. Uh, today I want to start talking about sonorant acoustics. Uh, so kind of moving on from vowels and making transition to uh, more consonantal articulations, uh, at least in the acoustic domain. Um, we kind of left off last time talking about some interesting features of the acoustics of music. Um, so before I get into sonorants um, and primarily nasal acoustics today, uh, I wanted to show you a couple of videos that I kind of forgot about last time. Um, these are also videos I grabbed off the internet, so I'm not entirely sure that I'll be able to get away with uh, showing these to you without some sort of copyright infringement, dealy bob. So <laughs> uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll give it a whirl. Um, and if uh, I don't succeed, I'll just edit this part of the video out. Um, and then we'll move on to nasals afterwards. But this is um, kind of a fun feature of the... Uh, the world that people have put together musical roads in various parts of, um, well, the United States at least, and some other countries as well. So this is an example from New Mexico. Okay, what are we doing? Okay, just east of Albuquerque, there's a length of Route 66 that has rebel strips cut into it. That apparently, if you drive 45 miles an hour, it'll play America the Beautiful. So here we go. Okay, set to 45 miles an hour. I can hit this. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah, so as somebody who is road tripped extensively throughout the United States and also somebody who likes acoustics uh, you'd think I would have been there but I haven't yet so still got some some ways to go uh, this is a different video I think this is from the BBC uh, and this kind of explains a little bit more about how it works when they put one of these together um, yeah that video that road we just saw was in uh, rural New Mexico so I think it was kind of away from where anybody lives but I, I heard a different story um, about how they put a similar sort of road together in like the Netherlands, I think. Uh, and it was too close to a, a village or a town and then it just ultimately just drove people crazy because they were hearing the same tune over and over again. Uh, this is kind of a different way to drive people crazy. Um, so I'll let this guy explain how this particular road works or maybe did not work. Yeah, you're in the desert, why not? Uh, <laughs> I know how that guy feels too. Uh, not that I ever retake these videos when I'm lecturing to you guys in the privacy of my own home. Um, anyways, so uh, that's just kind of uh, some fun uh, and a link to music as well, uh, which is always almost always fun. So uh, be that as it may, we're gonna move on to some new fun today. Um, like I said, we're gonna talk about sonorant acoustics. Uh, and so, so far we've talked a lot about the acoustics of vowels, uh, where we talked about how we have the, kind of the source of the sound, which is the openings and closings of the vocal folds. Uh, which produced the sound to begin with. Uh, and that sound is shaped by the filter above the vocal folds, which is your vocal tract. Um, and we can shape that filter um, by pushing our articulators around, by perturbing the um, vocal tract shape itself uh, to give it different characteristic resonant frequencies, which we call formants. Uh, and different formants lead to different vowels. Um, we can do similar things with consonants like sonorant consonants except we're going to kind of change the shape of the tube overall rather than just perturbing different parts of it it turns out so like i said i want to talk about the acoustics of sonorants I said that multiple times already but uh, we'll focus first on nasals uh, and then we'll see how that um, leads to sort of laterals which are similar to nasals in acoustic terms uh, and then approximants and then ultimately um, stop acoustics which have, share some features with approximants too uh, yeah so the source filter characteristics of all these are going to be similar to vowels with some interesting complications because like I said you can kind of change um, where the air flows uh, not just like what shape tube it has to flow through when you produce nasals and laterals and um, other consonants like that. So uh, one feature we have to keep in mind as we go through this is damping uh, which I've talked a little bit about or at least implied a little bit about um, previously in this course so damping is um, something that happens when you try to set up uh, a sound that resonates in a particular um, tube or resonance system. 
So basically, we can remind ourselves that we get resonance uh, when we're creating standing waves in tubes or resonating objects. So a sound wave is going to travel through that object and then get reflected and then reinforced on a periodic basis. And I'll show you kind of our basic setup here again on the next slide. Uh, but the crucial part of this is that we have to reinforce the sound at the right time, which is why they become periodic sounds. Uh, without that, the sound and the energy in the sound wave is just going to kind of dissipate um, into the world around it. Uh, but if we do reinforce it on a periodic basis, we'll get this standing wave pattern where we'll get alternating patterns of high and low pressure in the resonating tube. Uh, again, this is our basic setup. So we push the, well, we send a pulse of high air pressure down the length of the tube, it bounces, it gets reflected at the far end of a closed tube, and then comes back to this loudspeaker end or our vocal fold end, and then we push again at the right time such that we can kind of keep this pattern going indefinitely. Uh, and then we also notice that there's this um, rarefaction which kind of emerges behind the pressure pulse as it goes to the far end of the tube, and they kind of wind up switching places on a regular basis. So at this part, of the tube, we alternate between high pressure and low pressure. At this part of the tube, we alternate between high pressure and low pressure, but you know, at the opposite times of the other end of the tube. And then in the middle, the pressure just kind of stays the same because that's when they meet up and basically cancel each other out. Um, so this becomes a node in terms of our standing wave, and this becomes an anti-node, or both ends of the tube are anti-nodes in this simple, most simple, uh, simplest case scenario. Um, yeah, so. Think about that though, in terms of how we start out with this. So we start out with this traveling high pressure pulse going down the length of the tube. Um, if we just send that one pressure pulse through the tube and don't reinforce it, don't kind of push again at any point in time, that wave is eventually going to dampen and die out. Uh, so this is uh, the basic scenario that I gave you a while back, uh, where if we put a pressure level meter, say at the far end of the tube, we'd expect the pressure to rise as that pressure pulse travels down towards the far end of the tube. And then as it bounces and goes back the other way, that rarefaction will move in to replace it. So pressure will go down quite a bit. Then the initial pressure pulse will come back, but it starts to lose energy as it just travels through the tube because it's not a perfect scenario, right? There's some friction as it um, kind of slides past the walls and whatnot. And hopefully this is intuitive, right? You can't just like clap your hands no matter how loud and expect that sound to sort of exist in the world forever, right? It just filters out. So what that looks like if you sort of take the readout of the pressure level meter at the far end of the tube is that uh, with each sort of cycle of this pulse bouncing back and forth, it'll get weaker and weaker until it kind of smoothly fades out into nothingness. And we go back to this situation that we started off with. Um, yeah, so that's, again, basic physics, but it's kind of interesting to think about the mathematical implications of this because we're used to looking at sort of nice periodic waves which repeat consistently over time. Here we have one traveling wave which just kind of um, consistently dissipates over time until it disappears completely. Um, so we talk about this in terms of damping. Damping is just this tendency of a wave to disappear. Uh, and if a wave is damped more heavily, then it's going to disappear more quickly than a lightly damped wave. So this one's losing less energy to kind of the externals of the system. Uh, so it keeps going for at least more strongly for a little while longer than the heavily damped wave uh, until it eventually does peter out because this has to happen to every single sound that gets produced eventually. Um, unless you reinforce it. So the amount of damping that you get in a tube is going to be a function of, well, the tube basically itself, like that external part of the system. It's not so much inherent in the, um, the sound wave itself. So it will depend on the volume of the tube. So the more volume you have in the tube, the more damping you can get. The surface area of the tube, same story with that. And then also the material of which the tube is made. So if, uh, you are speaking or sort of sending a sound into a tube that's made out of harder materials, then uh, the sound can kind of bounce around more cleanly for a longer period of time. Uh, but if you push a sound into a tube made out of softer materials, that those softer mater materials will uh, absorb a little bit more of that energy. So that should dampen out the sound a little more quickly. Um, 
normally when I teach, uh, I am teaching in a, well, either a lecture hall or some room designed for the purpose. And uh, generally speaking, the university is pretty good because uh, they realize that this is kind of a problem um, when you are speaking in rooms that are sort of rectangular, gen generally speaking, and made out of hard surfaces, or at least have walls that are made out of hard surfaces. So you can speak in a classroom and then your voice can bounce around for a while, generally speaking. There's a bit, I mean, that reflection we get in a tube is basically an echo, right? Uh, even though it's like happening so quickly, you can't hear it kind of um, as distinct from the original sound. Uh, so there are normally in the university classrooms or lecture halls, some padding that has been uh, installed on the walls, some soft surfaces to kind of help damping so that you're not hearing sort of um, my, or any speaker's voice bounce around the room uh, for a long period of time after they actually say something. Uh, you can kind of, well, yeah, this goes back to what I was saying before, but uh, you can kind of think about this, um, and we talk about this in 341, but it's worth thinking about again, uh, that different rooms, whether they're classrooms or this kitchen or whatever, have different resonant characteristics. So uh, I notice this uh, when I go to, say, one of these big like hardware stores like Home Depot or uh, whatever, a Lowe's, I guess Rona doesn't exist in Canada anymore, at least not in Calgary, but um, they're enormous, right? So, uh, and they're made out of hard surfaces like everywhere you look, right? All at right angles. Uh, and you're, uh, well, they're so enormous in that case that your your voice can kind of get lost in it, but you also kind of hear the sounds um, that are coming from all over the, uh, the store itself. Uh, there's no way for them to kind of dissipate um, without traveling around until they kind of lose energy of their own accord. Uh, similarly, uh, this kind of drives me nuts. Um, I guess we aren't going out to restaurants as much anymore, but uh, there's kind of um, a set of design features you see in modern restaurants uh, where like you might have like an open kitchen so you can see the you know chefs working on the food. Um, and I guess that looks cool or whatever. Uh, and then like oftentimes with postmodern um, architectural design, they like don't have like a clear ceiling because they don't want to like hide the bare bones or the uh, sort of skeleton of how society works or whatever. There's some intellectual pretension in there, but, um, and they don't sit at, like, you know, comfortable little booths like you do in an old fashioned Denny's or something like that. So it winds up giving you like a lot of hard surfaces. There's, if there's no like carpeting on the floor, which is also not common in modern restaurants either. So you can, you're, if you are speaking, you may find it hard to understand um, your interlocutors, uh, the people you're having a conversation with uh, because the sound will also bounce around off all the hard surfaces. Then people are like cutting their food and so on and so forth. And the silverware is clinking and whatnot. And that noise just kind of reverberates constantly and makes it difficult to have a conversation. And I guess perhaps the point of that is um, so that you buy more alcohol or something like expensive like that. I don't know. Uh, either way, it kind of drives me nuts. Um, and that's maybe why you would more often find the inner old fashioned Denny's than uh, the cool restaurant downtown. But we don't need to talk about that. On the other hand, you can think about what, um, and, and this is another case of uh, an environment we may never find ourselves in again, but a movie theater um, is designed to sort of prevent echoes, at least the um, sort of room design um, has a lot of soft materials around the walls. Uh, often it has these curtains which are hanging down uh, on the sides, which uh, kind of have crenellations or folds in them so that when the sound from the speakers wherever they're uh, placed in the theater, um, come out and hit a wall surface. They don't sort of nicely bounce so that they can hit the other side of the uh, room and kind of bounce back and forth for quite a while because they produce a lot of loud sounds in many movies, right? Especially like modern action films or whatnot. Uh, so they don't want an echo in there. You just want to be able to hear what's coming out of the speakers themselves, the way that the, um, the uh, creators of the movie kind of designed the sound to sound like. Uh, so that's why they're there. And remember, they're, those are soft materials and they have little folds in them. And kind of in a really extreme uh, case of, the, oh yeah, I guess uh, I can give you one more example before um, I get into the anechoic chamber example. But if you go to the Jubilee Auditorium down uh, on the campus of SAIT, uh, it's really interesting how the whole um, auditorium is designed because you know there's a stage in which there's actors or singers or what have you. Uh, and then the, the uh, seating itself is kind of designed in a wedge. So it kind of went, it's very broadly open 
where the stage is like down here and then it kind of goes up into this wedge shape uh at the top of the like third balcony or whatever whatever it is uh i know this because uh <laughs> I do like to go to events sometimes, but I usually wind up getting seats like in the third balcony because they're uh, reasonably priced. Um, so uh, what happens or the idea, I think, is that this was an um, auditorium designed by people who really knew something about acoustics because sound, uh, which is projected from like the orchestra or, or band or whatever singers are in front of um, the audience, uh, could go up into kind of, sort of that wedge um sort of nook and cranny at the top of the um, balcony and just kind of get stuck there. It's not going to get, not going to bounce off like some flat surface at the um, back end of the auditorium and then come back and forth or bounce in between the walls on the sides either. Uh, so that kind of helps improve the acoustics or like your experience in terms of listening to um, whatever music is being produced um, on stage or whatever speech um, people are saying uh, as part of the play um, or performance. Uh, so an extreme example of this is an anechoic chamber, and this has that same sort of design um, many times over on a smaller scale. Uh, so this is a picture of an anechoic chamber, which I think is um, designed for industrial purposes. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess when you design a machine or a tool or a car piece or whatever that is going to make noise, you can test what its acoustic features are by, say, placing it in the middle of a room like this. Uh, and have it make its noise, and then you can make a really super nice, clean recording. Um, normally, we don't have uh, sort of the budget in linguistics to produce one of these chambers on, on our own. Uh, we use a um, sort of similar sort of idea, uh, like a sound um, attenuated booth. Uh, but what this does is that it has all of these wedges placed around the walls. Uh, they are also made of a relatively soft material so that the sound can't bounce off them um, that cleanly. And they're installed here like as wedges and kind of at these right angles uh, with each other so that when sound does um, kind of hit the walls or these wedges, it gets stuck in these nooks and crannies and can't really bounce back nice and cleanly um, between the walls. So you don't get much of a uh, sort of resonating effect with um, a chamber des uh, design like this. And when you do make a recording of whatever sound is being made here in the middle, you get just that sound by itself without the sound of the room kind of impinging on your recording, which is pretty neat. Uh, and like I said, this is a relatively extreme example, uh, but I can give you um, kind of the consequences of recording in rooms like this. So anytime you record in a room, like me recording in this kitchen right now, you're going to hear not only my voice, but you are going to hear the resonant characteristics of the room as well. Um, so maybe by now you've kind of gotten used to what this kitchen sounds like, but it's part of this recording that I'm presenting to you on this video. Uh, so yeah, like I said, the high, high quality sound recordings need to be made or should be made in specially designed rooms, which damp any reverberation. I've got um, some examples here, which I borrowed from a friend a long time ago. Uh, these, uh, some of these are, she was um, Chinese in origin, so some of these are in Chinese, which, and I can't tell you what they're saying. But uh, this is an example of a recording made in a classroom. Um, and these are rated according to their signal to noise ratio, which is a concept which is good for you to know. So uh, what this describes is basically the decibel level of what's being recorded, the, the signal or the speech that you're hearing compared to the noise in the background of that recording. So the higher this rating is, the more clean the recording is going to sound, the easier you can pick out the signal uh, out of the noise. This is rated at 29 dB, so the signal is 29 dB um, more intense than the noise. Uh, and you can hear the classroom echoing in this one pretty well. At least I hope you can. I'll turn up the noise a bit, or the volume a bit. Let's try that again with the volume at full blast. This is um, the second example is a sound attenuated booth, kind of like the one we have on the campus of the University of Calgary. Again, don't know when we'll see the inside of that again, but hopefully sometime soon. Uh, and this has um, a, radio, a signal to noise ratio of 44 dB, so it sounds a lot better. Uh, there's a little, actually, I've listened to this many times, and it's the first time I've heard this, but in, there's a bit of a buzz in the background. And we'll see that um, in the spectrograms on the next slide. This is a really clean um, recording from an anechoic chamber. 
December is a big gift month for eight-year-old Lauren Jenkins. We just hear the speaker um, by themselves without any of that background noise. And you can see background noise in a spectrogram if you take a look at a recording like this uh, in Prot. And you've probably seen spectrograms that look like this before if you've ever tried to produce recordings at home on your computer, like for the Lang 341 production exercises. Sometimes they work better than others. Um, but this kind of fuzzy noise in the background, it shows up, it sort of looks like um, a fricative, but it's sort of like a permanent fricative uh, that kind of goes all the way through the speech um, that you would prefer to be able to look at. Uh, so this kind of obscures a lot of the format frequencies and whatnot and makes it a bit difficult to um, get good acoustic information out of a recording like this. Uh, this is the soundproof booth example. 8, and you can kind of hear that low frequency hum right at the beginning there. This is, it looks like maybe this could be voicing for a um, voiced stop or something like this at the beginning of this utterance, uh, but it's not, it's just the, the room or whatever um, is part of the uh, recording setup that this uh, speaker is using. 8, 8, uh, so it's not terrible, but um, it'd be nicer not to have that. So this is what it looks like when you don't. Uh, you just get super nice, clean, uh, nothing <laughs> before the speaker starts to speak. December is a big gift month for eight-year-old Lauren Jenkins. <clears throat> yeah, uh, so I want to play this one as well. And I'd say listen to this one closely because uh, it's the same sentence as the first one, but it's pronounced slightly differently. December is a big gift month for eight-year-old Lauren Jenkins. Yeah, so I believe the name at the end there is Jenkins, as I would say, J-E-N-K-I-N-S. Uh, but this guy says it slightly differently than this speaker. December is a big gift month for eight-year-old Lauren Jenkins. More, more like an eh, or maybe a nasalized eh in that Jenkins. December is a big gift month for eight-year-old Lauren Jenkins. And he pushes that vowel a little bit higher to more like Jenkins. Um, we'll come back to that uh, in a bit. Okay, uh, oh yeah, there's one other thing I can show you. Um, I've never shown this in class because I can never succeed in downloading the uh, the video of this somehow, but it's on YouTube. Uh, this is a, well, if you're a nerd, this is a classic, uh, but otherwise this is just an obscurity, uh, but it's an interesting one for our purposes. So there is a guy, his name is Alvin, Alvin Lucier, I guess, uh, or Lucier. Uh, he, I guess he's an experimental musician. Um, so this is this famous recording. Uh, he describes it as we go through it. So I'll play a little bit of it for you, but it's him sitting in a room. Uh, and of course that room has its own characteristic resonant frequencies. It's like a formant. It's like a vocal track that you can't change the shape of. So it has its own formants and it'll always have those formants. And he just sits in the middle of the room and says, I am sitting in a room, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then he just takes that recording and replays it over and over again in the same room until he does it enough times that you can no longer understand the underlying speech which he produced uh, in making the recording and you just hear the characteristic resonant frequencies of the room. Um, yeah, it's a 45 minute album. It may have been more popular in the past. Right now it's just kind of a nice little curiosity for us to think about. Different from the one you are in now. Oh, come on. Let's try that again. I am sitting in a room different from the one you are in now. I am recording the sound of my speaking voice and I am going to play it back into the room again and again until the resonant frequencies of the room reinforce themselves. All right. As promised, that's what he does. Uh, I, I'm noticing when he speaks that he has a super breathy voice, but that's something that's a separate issue. So let's listen to various parts of this because, again, he speaks for about a minute and then just repeats it over and over. And any irregularities my speech might have. And you can hear the room start to emerge. And his voice starts to fade away. what the room wants to sound like basically that 
is how it would resonate um, if you just played the right frequencies in it. Uh, yeah, so you could probably make better music than that. Um, but that's how that guy got famous. So whatever it takes, right? Um, okay, so let's get back to the main topic of today's lecture, which is nasals. So uh, when you produce a nasal, air flows through your nasal cavities. Uh, and I've got a um, diagram here, or a picture of what it looks like inside your nasal cavities. Uh, and this is um, sort of sliced through the middle of your head this way. Um, so again, don't try this at home, but this is looking at one nasal passageway and the other as the air, kind of, air kind of goes through it like this. When you open up your nasal passageway so that air can flow through these structures, you get a similar sort of situation as when you say have, um, you know, like crenellated folds on the side of a movie theater or those wedges in the anechoic chamber, uh, that this is, you know, soft tissue in your nose. Uh, and it's got these little nooks and crannies in it. There's a lot of surface area, a lot of volume. Uh, there's going to be a lot of damping um, as air fl flows through your nose. So you can also stop uh, for a minute and think about this. So we speak um, sort of our ability to speak is sort of superimposed on top of pre-existing biological structures in our bodies. Uh, and so our noses are no different in that respect because our noses, well, primarily they give us a, a way to breathe, right? But um, the function of these things in so much as biological things have a function is that it helps humidify and warm up the air uh, as it goes into your body so that you're not getting like this um, harsh cold air getting into your lungs when you like go outside in the winter time in an environment like Calgary, right? Um, but additionally, what winds up happening if we speak through our nose is that we get damping of the um, source signal that's coming out of our, our vocal folds. So, uh, oh yeah, there's another point I should make about this, which is that um, the exact size and shape of nasal cavities can vary wildly from speaker to speaker. This is a kind of um, a unique sort of uh, fingerprint for everybody that you might not actually want to ever think about, but uh, it's there. And people back in the 90s had this idea that maybe um, we could use this feature of uh, the human um, body to sort of identify who is speaking um, as a clever form of speaker identification or automatic speaker identification. Uh, so I've got some um, data here from a study that was done uh, in 1994 that looks at basically the uh, volume or I guess uh, surface area um, looking at MRI measurements of people's noses uh, for, I guess, yeah, I don't know if this is four or eight different speakers uh, because it's got left. Yeah, so basically there's a sequence um, as uh, air goes through your nose where it has to go, uh, it just goes through one passageway and then it splits uh, between left and right passageways. And you can see that some speakers have say more area in their right nasal passageway than their left and others say have more in their left than their right and it's just a little bit different for each single person. Uh, the problem with this as a form of speaker identification or a cue for speaker identification is that it, it there's no real clear way to sort of go from this to sort of what we get from the acoustics. Um, overall, we get things like damping out of uh, the nasal passageways, but they don't really pick out specific frequencies, which make it easier to um, identify one person versus another just based on what their nose shape is. But these differences are there, right? Everybody is unique. Um, thankfully. Uh, so uh, what effects does this have when air goes through your nose when you speak? And the primary one we're going to see is damping. Uh, so this is, I think, Peter Latifoged saying um, that um, in both waveform and spectrogram form. And you can see the damping of the nasal really nicely. Uh, it reduces the amount of intensity in the signal because it's sucking energy out of it, right? So we get a nice, um, clear, intense, highly sonorant vowel like ah, um, uh, which has clear resonant frequencies. If we look at it in the spectrogram form, we get resonant frequencies or formants for the mm as well, but they're not um, as intense. Um, what we get is just kind of this nice break in between vowel and nasal and between nasal and vowel when we get out to the other side too. That's obvious where that happens, and beca that's because you're kind of clearly opening and closing that ve uh, velopharyngeal port um, at the um, 
back of your palate, uh, which either allows air to flow through the nose or cuts air off from flowing, flowing through the uh, nose for the vowels here. Uh, so when that happens, it's obvious, it's kind of a quantum leap as it were, uh, but otherwise the main effect we're looking at now is that this is going to be a quieter sound than um, a vowel like ah. Um. Okay, so that's part of damping, but the other part of damping is that it changes the spectral features of the nasal sound. So we can think about um, what an undamped wave looks like, where we get this nice repetition consistently over time. This is one of our basic uh, examples of a simple or sine wave. Um, you can compare that to what a damped wave looks like. We saw a few examples a little while ago. Uh, this is just a wave that starts out um, looking nice and fresh and sprightly uh, and then kind of just drifts off over time. Uh, I'm not going to make any comparisons to old age, but you could if you really wanted to. Uh, what we need to think about instead is what sort of features would that have, um, what sort of effects would that have on the spectral features of these sounds. Uh, like I said, this is sort of um, a simple sine wave, a uh, basic atom of sound as it were. So when we look at the power spectrum of this guy, we should just see one frequency uh, on the frequency scale, one harmonic on that frequency scale, just a little spike. Uh, we've created those, or at least hopefully you've created those for your homeworks. Uh, and But to get a damped wave that looks like this, we can't do it with just one frequency, even though it looks like it's repeating sort of um, at the same times, more or less, uh, as it kind of diminishes into nothing. To get this pattern instead, we have to create a broader range of harmonic components of uh, the complex wave. Uh, so we're not going to get one, we're going to get a range of harmonics. Um, should walk you through a little um, basically thought experiment as to why this happens. So we can take like a 100 hertz sine wave and hopefully you can hear this. It's a fairly low frequency. Um, it kind of gives you some blips on the beginning and end because uh, we're getting features, uh, problems like this where you go from some amplitude to zero in a second. Try not to worry about that. That's just the tone you get um, to start off with. If you want to, you could add this to a 90 hertz sine wave and get a complex wave out of that. That's the 90 hertz sine wave by itself. You can hear it's at a slightly lower frequency, hopefully. Uh, and then we'll also add uh, one on the other side, a uh, 110 hertz sine wave. So uh, if you remember what I was saying before when we looked at just one um, sine wave by itself is that it repeats at the same time uh, or it has a consistent period so it repeats. Uh, regularly over time uh, and we get these peaks at regular intervals and it looks like with that damped wave we'd have peaks at similar intervals as we go through but kind of think about this how do these peaks line up if we put all three of these together for the first cycle they're pretty close so they'll all kind of add to each other and give us a nice um, relatively nice peak but when we look at the next peak here we get more time misalignment, right? So these two were pretty well lined up to begin with. Now this one's here and this one's a little bit later. This one's a little bit earlier, right? Because it's a higher frequency. Uh, and as we keep going, they're going to mismatch in time um, to an even greater extent. So these ones are really not close at all. So they're not sort of reinforcing each other here. Uh, instead, they're damping out right um this is gonna uh as we keep going eventually these will kind of line up with negative parts of the sine wave so this negative part of this sine wave will cancel out a lot of the positive um pressure here and this one's at zero basically so it doesn't really add anything to the system and that's why at least over a short amount of time this combination of sine waves will make the um, overall pattern of the complex wave get closer and closer to zero um the result is something that looks like this. I put these together in prot. Uh, when you actually play it, it something odd kind of happens. Uh, but this is what one cycle of this complex wave looks when you just add these three together. I'll play it, um, and you'll hear that sort of odd effect, or you get that kind of beating <laughs> effect because what happens after this initial cycle is that this sine waves kind of line up again um, over time and then they go up back up to a peak. 
Um, so you wind up getting like a big um, cycle, uh, each one of which looks like this, and that gets repeated over time. Uh, so it looks like you have sort of a lower frequency pattern um, that gives you that beating effect. Um, I just found out not that long ago, uh, I don't know how I found this out or, or why, but since we talked about music, I might as well mention it, that um, one of the reasons that the frequency scale is tuned as it is to those specific frequencies in Western music is because the um, frequencies are sort of lined up in a way that prevents this sort of beating effect from happening. Um, and that when notes do tend to get out of tune, like on your piano or guitar or whatever, uh, and you try to play them together, you start to hear that sort of perceptual oscillation or acoustic oscillation rather. Um, so that's what the scale is basically designed to avoid is something that sounds like this, uh, which is not really that, well, not musical in the sort of uh, harmonious sense we normally think about, but um, something you normally would want to avoid when you're like playing the piano or two notes on a piano. Uh, anyways, if the 90 hertz and 110 hertz components have less amplitude than the 100 hertz wave, you'll get less damping. Uh, so you kind of get more um, signal here of sort of the middle frequency rather than the ones on the side. So you don't get that sort of beating effect quite as much in this case. Um, but if, yeah, again, if you have ever played a piano out of tune and you listen closely, you, you can hear this sort of effect. Uh, not that I'm going to like dwell on that for too long. Uh, but also acoustically, you see that the amplitude here is diminishing more slowly. So that means less damping, right? And it's because we have less amplitude sort of on the sides um, of our spectral shape here. Okay, so what this will wind up looking like uh, if we take a look at the waveforms and the power spectra is that a lightly damped wave is going to have a strong peak uh, in the middle of its spectrum. So it's gonna have one harmonic which kind of dominates. And then on the sides, it will have other harmonics, but they will be uh, considerably less intense than this one in the middle. Uh, and that should basically be more or less symmetric on either side as it kind of fades away to give you this uh, overall pattern in the waveform. Uh, if you have more damping, what winds up happening is that this peak in the middle gets less and less um, pronounced or less and less prominent. Uh, and the harmonics on the sides um, become sort of more uh, integral to the overall shape of the spectrum. So with heavy damping, you get just a kind of a mini bump here in the middle. Uh, and this is a waveform which is gonna dissipate quite quickly. Uh, and these harmonics on the sides will have a lot more to contribute to the overall shape of the sound. Okay, so there's kind of two elements there one of which is how quickly does the sound fade away in terms of damping, and the other is how peaked, basically, is our um, sort of power spectrum. Uh, the way we can kind of describe this sort of peakedness of the power spectrum is by going back to this concept of bandwidth, uh, which I talked about a little bit when we were going over bandpass filters. So the bandwidth, again, is the range of frequencies over which a filter responds at 0 0.707 of its maximum output. This is, the square root of two over two or the square root of one half. So the bandwidth describes where you're getting half of the acoustic power of the whole complex wave. How many, how many, what range of frequencies do you need to fit in half of its acoustic power, basically? Uh, so nasal formants, air flowing through your nose when you speak is going to damp the speech signal overall. So nasal formants will also spread out the bandwidth of um, the formants that they produce. Uh, sorry, nasal sounds are gonna, I think I said nasal formants, spread out the formants, but nasal sounds will have wider bandwidths in their formants than just oral vowels um, that don't involve airflow through the nose. So that's another acoustic feature we can look for when we see uh, um, nasals in spectrograms. And this is a convenient example which shows you this fairly nicely. So this is uh, also a Chinese speaker. Ma. Uh, Mandarin speaker rather. So uh, this is ah, F1 and F2 for ah kind of come together, and this is F3 for ah. Ma, ma. And um, this is not all that common that you can see this in nasals, uh, but this is a nice clean recording, as we mentioned before. So we've got F1 here, we've got F2 here uh, pretty faintly, and then there's F3. So F3 uh, for this M 
Uh, might be a little bit lower in frequency than the F3 for the AW, and then hopefully you can see that um, it has a broader bandwidth. So it's kind of got a wider range of frequencies over which we can see this prominent gray smudge, right? It's less intense, broader in bandwidth, uh, and maybe a little bit lower in frequency than this F3 for the AW. Ma, ma. Okay, so generally speaking, nasal formants well, nasals are gonna have formants like vowels because you're just creating a tube through your nose um, that resonates in a similar fashion as it does for vowels, uh, as your mouth does for vowels. Uh, but those formants are gonna be weaker in intensity and they will have increased bandwidth. But otherwise, they're gonna be, roughly speaking, in you know the same frequency spots that we expect uh, formants for vowels. Okay, so what frequencies will we get uh, for nasal stops, that's kind of the simplest case to think about. Uh, we can use the same formula that we've kind of hammered to death at this point um, for calculating the formant frequencies of an open tube. Uh, we can apply that not just to vowels, but to um, nasal sounds as well, um, with a few little uh, caveats to that. But let's start off with this equation. So the nth formant frequency of an open tube is going to be two n minus one times the speed of sound over four times the length of that tube. Uh, and we can walk through the simplest case, which is uh, an uvular nasal or um, this guy, uh, the capital N symbol. I just realized I forgot to set up something, but we'll, we'll survive. Uh, anyways, the length of the tube in this um, idealized case is going to be a combination of the distance from your glottis to your uvula, which is where you're basically closing off or opening up the velopharyngeal port when you produce a nasal or not. So that distance is nine centimeters. Uh, and then the distance through your nose itself from the uvula through your nose to the nostrils is 12 and a half centimeters. If you're say a more or less the size of someone like me. Um, so overall, hopefully you can recall that um, my vocal tract length or kind of a general vocal tract length would be 17 and a half centimeters. Uh, this is going to give us a sort of nasal tract length, if you will, or pharyngeal nasal, nasal pharyngeal tract length of 21 and a half centimeters. So that's longer than the passageway through um, the mouth, right? If it's a longer tube, what does that mean for our frequencies? We're just gonna change this element of the equation, right? So the denominator gets bigger. That means the overall frequency should get lower, right? Um, so longer tube gives us lower formant frequencies, which we saw just a brief while ago um, in that spectrogram. Uh, so here's what it looks like um, in diagrammatic form. So we have air going through our pharynx and then also through our nose. We're closing it off from going into the mouth here. Um, and those are my measurements. These two are supposed to be together to give us 12 and a half centimeters. So you might have to use your imagination a little bit. And like I said, the only thing we're changing here from what we've seen before is the length at, on the bottom of the um, fraction here. So F1 should be um, equal to 35,000. This feature or this um, term reduces to one. So the speed of sound over four times the length of the tube, which is 86. You can crank out the math on a calculator maybe, or I can just show it to you and let you know that it's gonna be about 407 hertz. So our F1 for a tube of length 17 and a half centimeters, uh, like for schwa, as we calculated before, will be 500 hertz. F1 for a tube of this length will be something like 407 hertz. So it's gonna go down a bit, right? Um, for the other frequencies, we can calculate them the same way. So F2 should be three times this, it's gonna be, which is 1,221 hertz. F3 should be five times that, should, so it should be 2,000 something hertz, 2,035 in this particular case. Um, yeah, you can double check the math at home if you want, but this is how it works with the nice simplifying assumption that no air at all is going into the mouth because we're closing off our um, vocal tract with this uvular N articulation. Okay, um, like I said, I realized uh, just a minute ago that I forgot to load up this uvular nasal example here. Uh, and I actually do wanna show that to you so we can kind of confirm that it has the right or more or less correct formant frequencies in the nasal part of that. 
Um, so I'm going to pause the video now and do that. So we'll pick up again at this point uh, in the second half of this lecture. My apologies.